Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Welcome to our, I think, seventh week studying the book of Colossians. I'm so happy to see you all this morning. So glad to be back in action. I know last week was a little different because it was recorded instead of going live. And so I'm really hoping uh, that you all are connecting with us again today, right now at 10 a.m. I'm going to just let people click on um, and, and get joined in. I hope you've got your tea or your coffee or um, definitely your Bible and are ready to go. I, I had to email some people today and just let everybody know I'm so excited for this passage today. I've been waiting for it and praying over it. I just couldn't wait. Um, if you're familiar with this portion of scripture, uh, you'll know why. It's um, it, literally, it has probably one of the most confusing verses within this passage. It is convicting, it is challenging, but it also has a verse that is of the most consequence to anyone who is a follower of Christ. Powerful, powerful. Can't wait to unpack this uh, passage together. But I wonder if we would take a moment and let's pray over our time. If you're anything like me, you've already been up for a while. Things are happening. If you've got kids, you're trying to settle them down. So much is going on. And so let's just offer this time, what we have right here, up to the Lord. Pray over it. We want to ask for his presence to be with us, to calm our morning and to allow our minds to refocus on our King. Amen. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for this time together. Lord, we thank you for the ability through technology to stop what we're doing and to join together as your body. God, that together right now, I know there are many uh, across the different states, um, maybe even out of the country that have their Bible opened and are a part of the church, your body. And so God, I just thank you for that. Lord Jesus, we want to ask that you would uh, come and be with us, Lord, today, that you would remove all distractions, anything that might uh, detract from your word going forth with power and authority. We thank you for what you have to say to us today. God, we pray that you would prepare our hearts to receive your word, God, and to apply your word to our lives. We love you so much. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would just flood through this uh, streaming ability, God, into every home, into every living room, uh, through every phone or computer or device, God, but that your presence would unite us and your presence, God, would powerfully lead us today in our study. Lord, we just lift up your name and we ask that you be glorified, exalted, magnified in our lives, in our minds right now. Would you turn our attention to you? Let us fixate on you for this set period of time. And God, we, we just pray, Lord, that you would do mighty works through your word in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Amen, right? Um, you know, I have to tell you this because um, it's so important to know what it is we're chasing in this life. It's so important. And this, I had to tell my husband, this thought kept striking me um, this week because if anybody out there owns more than one dog or you've ever been in a place where there's multiple dogs all together. I kind of see that our family, you know, joined together, always seems to have a pack of dogs. We have a couple, my folks have a couple, you know, and so when we all get together, there's kind of this pack of dogs. But I notice it even within the two that I have in my house all the time. Maybe you can relate if you've ever been around this, but one dog out of maybe all of them, one dog will, you know, jump up, nobody's going after, maybe start barking, tear off after something uh, that he saw, that he heard, that he wants, and he knows what he's doing. But what happens to the rest of those dogs? They all jump up, start barking, going all over the place. They don't even know why, but they're just caught up in the hype of it. And this was happening so much this week with our dogs. It was driving me crazy. I wanted to say to the one who had no idea, you don't even know why you're barking. You don't even know why you're up. And while you're running, you have no clue. And you know, they'll come back not really knowing what to do and just lay down and fall asleep again, where the one who actually knew what they were doing comes back with the prize, whatever it may be that they were after. At least that's happened in our home. But it's just, it kept striking me this idea of this pack mentality where sometimes, I mean, isn't it like that in churches or at conferences or, or where there's a group of us together, somebody, is going to know what they're after. 
Somebody's going to know what they're chasing after. They're going to know what they're called to. They're going to be going after it with all vigor. And it's enough to excite people around them. And sometimes, you know, people start jumping up and getting excited, but they don't really know what it is they're after. They don't really know what they're going towards. And we can kind of get into this really big excitement mentality, but don't really know why. And I'm always thinking about that because Paul is someone who knew what he was going after, knew what he was called to do. And for him, he didn't just want to create excitement with people. He wanted others to know what it is they're supposed to be chasing after as well. And we need to ask ourselves, what are we chasing in this life? And is it all it's advertised to be? And there's a reason I bring up this one. Is it all it's advertised to be? Oh my goodness, you guys. Okay, so during this beginning stages of what we've been experiencing in our country, uh, I call it the stage with no toilet paper. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But in this early stage, there seemed to be such a uh, lack of toilet paper, at least around the area that we live in. Now, we were just, you know, starting to find out about what was going on around everything. This was really early on. We just simply needed toilet paper. I know some people were hoarding it and stocking up on it and you know everything else. We just simply were out of our normal amount of toilet paper, went to go look for it and could find it nowhere. So we, we started getting a little bit panicky, didn't want to have to think about what we'd have to do if we didn't physically have the toilet paper, but you know, uh, so we, we just started looking around and we had the hardest time finding anything. Um, and so we finally went online through a particular popular online distribution center. Um, and we ordered what was advertised to look like huge, gigantic, like 16 rolls of, you know, your double toilet paper, um, you know, kind of like your Costco size toilet paper roll. And so we ordered it and we needed it. So we were excited, you know, for it to get here. And um, lo and behold, you know, weeks go by, nothing. We don't see anything. Thank goodness for the loving people around us who actually had some toilet paper and shared it with us. I don't want you to think we were going without any because we had some, but this particular toilet paper we had ordered never showed up. In fact, so we ordered this in March. I just received that toilet paper a couple days ago. Just received it. In fact, I didn't even know I'd forgotten all about it. I didn't understand what this package was when they brought it to me. And I'm feeling it, I'm like, this is a weird package. And I open it up and lo and behold, it is the missing toilet paper. Now, here was the part that was even more confusing to me though. I know what I ordered. Uh, it was talking about, you know, uh, these large rolls, giant, double stuffed toilet paper, whatever it's called. I pull out, I wish I wanted to bring it to uh, you today to show you, but I open up this package. I kid you not, what is in there is like Barbie doll sized toilet paper rolls. It was the smallest little toilet paper rolls I've ever seen in my life. If I hadn't been laughing so hard, they're so cute. I'm so thankful that we did not need them right now or we would have been in a whole world of trouble. I mean, I don't know. I think you'd use an entire roll for one trip to the, to the bathroom, maybe more depending on who you are. But these little rolls, they're so cute, but they were so tiny. And I'm telling you something, I mean, maybe half of a ply, just little, short, tiny little things. They were not what they were advertised to be. And my daughter and I are just sitting there laughing hysterically at this because now we've waited months. We spent a lot of money on this toilet paper, you know, where you have to just take two little fingers to pull it out. It was not what it was advertised to be. And I want to bring this up because in this world, sometimes what we're chasing, what we're going after, we're going to find out is not all it's advertised to be. It's not going to be the fullness of life that we thought it was. It still might leave us wanting. It still might leave us in need because it is not all it's advertised to be. Know what it is you're chasing. Don't be one who's just caught up in the hype, but know what it is you're after so that through God, you may attain it. You may lay hold of it and that it will be more than you could have ever imagined it to be. This is something that Paul knew. He knew what he was after. And let me tell you something, what he was after, it was greater than any Costco sized roll of toilet paper. It was the manufacturer himself. Paul knew who he was after and it was going to be more than what was advertised. 
so much more. In fact, just keep getting better and better. And in, in light of our introduction, I want to end with this because this has been so precious to me ever since the day I was first um, I shared this story. But there was uh, somebody who had a, a grandma was sharing this story. Um, but her grandmother was uh, older in life. She had terminal cancer and the doctor had let her know that she didn't have long to live, maybe a couple weeks left. Now this was a sharp older lady. Uh, she loved the Lord with all of her heart and she was not afraid at all for what was to come. But she called her pastor and had him come over and she begins to share with him uh, how she would love her service to go. She wanted it to bless her kids and her grandkids to speak to those who might show up who may not yet know the Lord. And so just like normal goes through the songs and maybe the type of sermon he might preach and he, you know, he's loving on her. He gets up to leave when they're finished and she says, oh wait, I, I almost forgot the most important thing to tell you about my burial. And so he goes, okay, absolutely, what is that? And, and it was gonna be an open casket uh, you know, procession where people could pay their respects walking by the open casket. My grandmother's was like this. Um, and so she said, here's the thing, I want you to have me in that casket with my hand up next to my head and I want a fork in my hand. I want to be holding on to a fork, a normal plain dinner fork. I want to be holding on to it. You know, of course, this young pastor is looking at her very puzzled, you know, wondering, is this the medication talking? Does she know what it is she's saying? And, you know, if she, you know, she was a pretty feisty old lady from what I could tell. And she looked at him and said, now, is there, is there something troubling you, young man? And he says, well, I have to admit, I'm a little puzzled. I want to make sure I heard you right. You want to be in the casket holding a dinner fork? Is that accurate? And she says, absolutely. She goes, let me tell you something, son. Now I've been in church my whole life and I have gone to every potluck dinner at the church imaginable. And let's just be honest, churches don't exist without gathering around food. And she said, and I have loved every one of those, but my favorite part came at the end of the meal when people began to clean up uh, the food and they start removing plates from the table and somebody inevitably would look at me and say, you can go ahead and keep your fork. And you know what that meant? Something better was coming. Oh, I was about to get something good. Not just the food we've been having. I was about to get me some pie, some cake. Something good was on the way when somebody told me I could keep my fork. Something better was coming. And she said, Pastor, I want you to give me a fork in my hand. And when people look at that casket and they think something weird is going on, I want you to start to preach to them. And you tell them she's holding a fork because she knows something better is on the way. Something better is coming. That she's about to get the best uh, that this world could never have offered her. And I just fell in love with that lady whom I'd never met. I fell in love with her heart for the Lord. I think it's amazing. True story. I think it's wonderful. But here's what I was thinking about. You know, I actually had told my son this a while ago after hearing it. I told him, I said, okay, now you don't, I want you to understand what's happening when I'm buried. I'm going to be buried with a fork and I want you to know why. And so I started to tell him because he's looking at me like I'm crazy. But as I was going through this and preparing for this today, what I started thinking about is, you know, what is a wonderful thing, a wonderful concept to be buried with that fork in your hand because you know something better is coming. But to me, what God started laying on my heart is, Ashley, you don't have to wait for that. You need to be living with a fork in your hand right now, knowing that the best is yet to come, knowing that something better is coming. And so I started thinking about that and I started thinking, you know what? I want to do the work that God is calling me to do with a Bible in one hand and a fork in the other so that when people are around me, they're going to know this woman means business and she knows the best is yet to come. She is saving her fork because it's coming. It's coming for everybody who believes, everybody who believes, even right now in this life, something better is coming. If you don't know the Lord and you make that commitment to follow him, something better is coming. I just love it. I had to share that with you today. We're going to see what that something is. We're going to see what it takes uh, and how it's done. And I want us to open up the word of God with that in our mind. Let's know what we're going after. Let's know that it's so much better than anything that's advertised in this world. We're not going to be a hype uh, puppy where we just get caught up in somebody else's excitement I pray that God would give us such tenacity that we can see where he's calling us, see what he's asking us to do, and that we would run after it knowing what it is we're chasing. Amen? 
Amen? All right, I want us to get into the Word of God today. So if you have your Bible, open up. Of course, we're in the book of Colossians, chapter 1. We're going over verses 24 through 29 today. Now, I'm going to attempt this with you. i got to be honest, I only got to start working on this about halfway through the week as far as memorization. It's been a crazy week here. I wish to goodness I could just give you the testimonies of this week. I have to shout out to God. He has done some miraculous, amazing things in this family's life. He is leading us in ways that are shocking us right now. And so hopefully soon I'll be able to share some of that with you. But let's turn to the word and let's look at it together. I'm reading from the NIV version, verse 24. Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become a servant uh, of, of it. I have become its servant by the commission that God has given me uh, to present you with his word in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden from ages and generations and is now being disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is him that we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may be able to present everyone fully mature in Christ. It is to this end that I strenuously contend with all the energy that Christ so powerfully works in me. This is the word of God. Amen. Oh, I hope you're getting excited. Amen. 24. We want to jump right into this verse 24. It says this. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. Of course, many of us know if you followed with us this whole time, we know Paul is in prison while he's writing this letter. He is somebody who knows what it means to suffer for Christ. He knows more than most of us what it means to suffer for Christ. Listen to what he says though. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. I, I was struck by the fact that this is often not something we talk about uh, in Christianity. You won't find it uh, most often on, you know, Christianity posters. Have you ever thought about this? Suffering is not necessarily what we fill our recruitment packets with. Anybody know what I'm saying? That's not always the verbiage that we're putting out there while we're wanting people to come to know Christ. I can't tell you how many conversations I have had. No joke, this is very real. How many conversations I've had over the years with people who have been shocked to find out that this following Jesus thing is quite hard, that it's difficult. Has anybody ever been there? Where man, you're just pretty shocked at how difficult this is. I think this happens because oftentimes we maybe fill people's heads with uh, this thought of just sunshine, rainbows, and unicorns, um, and that when we choose to accept Jesus uh, for our salvation, that basically all of our problems will be over. And we kind of give that thought to what it means to be a follower of Christ. Your problems will be over. And I do not want you to mistake me uh, right here. I want you to know something. Jesus is the light of this world, and you better believe that that light is going to flood your life that there is going to be unspeakable blessings and riches in following Jesus. But like anybody who's been a Christian for more than a minute knows, yes, some of your problems will be gone. They will be conquered. They will be removed through the blood and the work of Christ. Some of those problems in regards to the bondage of sin you were under will be removed through the power of Christ in your life. But here it is, listen to me, in its place, you will receive a whole additional set of problems. Following Jesus is kind of like exchanging one set of problems for another. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. It's not all easy. It's not all sunshine. Following Jesus is, is like this. It's not all health and wealth and butterfly tales like some like to preach. I want you to hear this straight from the mouth of Christ himself. If you don't believe me, these are not my words. These are literally the words of our Savior. And it baffles me when people spend so much time 
declaring that you will not suffer in this life. You will be rich beyond imagination. You will have, you know, all of the Maseratis you want. You know, all of these things. And it's not that Christ can't bring those into your life. But that is not the guarantee and the promise. He's after something far greater. He's after our eternity. He's after our souls. He's after our relationship with him. He's not about temporal things unless it's for the advancement of the kingdom of God within his plan. Amen? And so I want you to hear straight from the mouth of Jesus. Here's how Jesus recruited his followers. Here's what he would say. I'm just going to go through them pretty quickly. Luke 10.3. He says, behold, I'm going to send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Get ready because that's coming. You're going to be like lambs in the midst of wolves. He says, if anybody is going to come after me, he has to deny himself, take up his cross, that, that uh, uh, device of torture and death daily, he says, and follow me. He says this uh, to a great crowd, if anybody were to come to me, and does not hate his own mother and father, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost to see whether or not you can complete it? He says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. This is Matthew 10, 34 through 37. Do not think I have come to bring peace on the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. For I will set man against father and daughter against mother and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. He has left you an example, so that you will follow in his footsteps. We know Paul and Philippians will say it this way. Listen, whatever things were gained to me, those I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. For whom, Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Jesus says, remember what I have spoken to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. He says in Mark 13, 13, everyone, I don't think you could get more clear than this. Everyone will hate you because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end, we talked about this last week, who perseveres to the end, will be saved. 2 Timothy 3, 12, oh, 12 warns us, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. Are you guys seeing any maybes in there? He's not saying you may be persecuted. You may have tough times. Jesus isn't saying maybe some won't like you. Everybody will hate you because of me. If I have been persecuted, you will be persecuted. In Acts 9, to, to end this, um, Paul, we know he's remembering his conversion, that miraculous moment where God transformed his life. And we know what God spoke to Ananias. Paul shares it with us in Acts chapter 9, verse 15. God was speaking to Ananias and he told him, Go, this man, Saul, who would become Paul, is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Listen, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. How much he will suffer for my name. You know, I've heard it complained about uh, once people begin to find out that there's actually suffering involved in being a disciple of Christ. And I've heard this comment made several times. Um, you know, where, where was that knowledge? I feel like it was the fine print in the contract that we didn't get a chance to read. I've had people share that, you know, frustrated with how hard this walk of Christ is. And they go, what was this stuff? Just the fine print? But I'm telling you something, it's in bold lettering from the mouth of Christ himself. In fact, many of those verses I just read, if you have a Bible like this, they're going to be in bold red letters because they're from Jesus Christ himself to you. Nothing hidden. He says, listen, I'm going to be up front with you. I'm going to be honest with you. I have 
no place to lay my head. If you want to follow me, that's the kind of life you're going to have. My life is a life of suffering and death and laying myself down for the sake of others to experience eternity. It's for the sake of others to know the gospel. Jesus makes it very clear he wasn't hiding any of this. We know that being a friend of this world makes you an enemy of God. But being a friend of God makes you an enemy of this world. Paul knew this better than most. Like I said, he's experiencing some of that suffering right now as he writes this letter. He's in prison and yet he's joyful knowing that what he's doing, what he's chasing after is going to mean eternity for many, many people. Eternity with God. He knows it's going to reap an eternal harvest. And I want to say something that I had said to all of us, uh, maybe it was a couple weeks ago within this study, but I want to bring it up again to make sure it's fresh in our minds. Reconciliation, reconciliation for the world uh, will not happen unless it comes through death. Reconciliation doesn't happen without death. We were setting that up. The Bible shared that with us a couple weeks ago. The reconciliation between God and mankind had to, was ordained to, come through the death of Christ on the cross. We've talked about any reconciliation we want between each other, between us humans, comes from one or the both of us being willing to lay down our lives for the other, to lay down our rights, to lay down our anger, to delay, lay down uh, what it is we want and our privileges for the other person. And now, just like we learned last week, we have the ministry of reconciliation in order to bring the world to Christ. And I'm going to tell you something, that will not happen without the daily sacrifice of our death, of picking up our cross and following Christ, dying daily to ourselves. That is the way God has called it to be. God uses suffering to advance the gospel, and he always has. I think one reason why is that in the darkest moments, in those dark moments of suffering, the world is able to see a light in us that doesn't make sense. It doesn't belong there. It's something that's going to make them stop and wonder and question what's going on. Why are they walking through this the way that they are? And it gives an open door with such power and authenticity for the work of Christ to operate through. God has chosen to bring about the spread of his gospel through the suffering of his body, the church. You know, I literally could tell you story after story after story of how I have personally seen, how I have heard, how I have known that the kingdom has been expanding through the avenue of suffering. Big stories, small stories. I don't know if you saw this in the news a while ago. Two Iranian women, uh, of course, natives to the country of Iran, where it is illegal to share the gospel of Christ within that country. These two women, radically saved, radically saved, knew exactly what they were going to run after, knew exactly what they were called to do. And so they began to do the unthinkable in that country, began to share the gospel on the streets with anybody that God would allow them to. They had to keep looking around and watching, not knowing if they were being watched and what would happen to them. Now they were in fact being watched unbeknownst to them and very soon they were brought on trial and thrown into one of the worst prisons in that country. They were thrown into prison and they had said later that being in prison was the most freedom to share the gospel they'd ever experienced. That while they were in there starving, being threatened with torture and execution, being hurt, they had opportunity every single day they were there to share the gospel with those who were hurting in the prisons. God, in fact, kept bringing person after person to them um, in order to share the gospel, and many, many were saved. They were in there a very long time, and then God did something miraculous. He allowed them to be set free. And when they came out of that prison, people you know, surrounding them and wanting to know what had happened were asking them questions like, are you okay? And how, how in the world did you make it through that time in such a horrible prison? And you know their answer? That wasn't prison. That was church. That was church. And I love that because it was through their suffering. Had they not been in that place, countless people would not have ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Don't tell me God doesn't work through suffering. That is the door in the avenue that he uses to lead this world to Christ. The Lord Jesus led us with that example and now it's ours to follow after. You can bring it down to smaller examples if you don't want something so far out there. Some of you know um, within the last couple of years, my daughter went through a really hard time being severely bullied at her school, uh, specifically by one particular girl leading it up. And I'm talking about it was much suffering, much tears, much hardship in front of everybody. And this girl, my daughter, Anna, she, in her suffering, she would not stop showing love to this one that was leading the charge against her. And at one moment uh, before they were leaving school, uh, my daughter looked at this girl. They were, they were next to each other. And, she's, and she told her, she said, it's been such a privilege and a joy getting to know you this year. I'm so sorry if you haven't felt the same about me. But I've really enjoyed getting to know you. And that's simply all she said. This little girl ends up finding her number, getting a hold of her, and asks the question, why were you so nice to me? I did not deserve that. Why were you being nice to me? And that opened the door for Annalise to begin sharing the gospel of Christ with this girl. And she began to share the reason why is because Jesus loves you. The reason why is because what he has done for you. And so she's got to share this. This little girl ended up going to youth group, going to church, uh, has become a believer. It's just so amazing all through the suffering. You see, if Anna hadn't been going through such a hard and painful time, that door to share the gospel would not have been open for this young lady who shared with Anna the abuse that she herself had been going through and why she was lashing out. God works through our suffering. I can't tell you countless time after time, God for some reason seems to choose to work in my life through bizarre sicknesses, uh, whether it's in this country or other countries, to the point where he'll put me in places where I have an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus and lead others to Christ. I wish I could go into all the testimonies. Some of you know some of them, but this is a continual thing that in suffering, God places us in people's paths that never may have heard the gospel without us walking through that. I can't be more clear on that. But here's the thing, going through it with joy, going through those moments of suffering with joy, that is a decision based on our perception and our perspective. I want to ask you a question today, maybe ponder it and think about it in life. Do you tend to look at yourself as somebody uh, who's like a dartboard? This is what I mean by that. Do you, do you think, man, I'm, I'm kind of more like a dartboard. That means uh, life is just being thrown at me. I'm getting pricked and needled constantly. I'm getting punctured. Uh, things are harmful to me and they're just getting thrown at me. Life is just getting thrown at me uh, continually. If that's how we see ourselves, this is how we're going to be acting in the world. I'll explain it. Or you have the choice of seeing yourself like a pipeline where all the suffering you're going through, the situations in your life is simply tubing for Jesus to work through. It is simply just a casing for which Christ is going to flow through. If the latter is your perspective of what you're walking through in life, if the latter is your perspective uh, for uh, walking through suffering, here's the difference. Life will not be something that happens to you, but happens through you. Amen? See, when you, when you have a dartboard mentality, life is just happening to you. That's all you think about. When you have a pipeline mentality, life is happening through you. Christ is moving through you and everything you're walking through is just tubing for the love and the life of Christ to be piped through you. Difficult marriages, financial struggles, hardships with your children, hardships physically, uh, hardships with somebody that you know at work, piping for the love of Christ and the life of Christ to flow through. You are not a dartboard. Life doesn't happen to you, Christian. Life happens through you because of the power of the work of Jesus Christ. What are you, a dartboard or a pipeline? Just something for some thoughts this morning. Something for us to think about. You know, Paul was able to suffer with joy, first of all, because he knew he was fulfilling what God had called him to do. The commission that Jesus gave him. And secondly, he knew that in his suffering, that meant he was truly joined with Christ. That he was truly joined with Christ. You guys remember this. Jesus is the head of the body. I want you to think about this yourself. Now you all know I just got through uh, being really sick. And I'm going to tell you something. When my head is sick, the rest of my body 
is sick. When my body is sick, my head is sick. We're all connected. It goes through each other. And Jesus had shown that even when Paul was persecuting the church and Jesus, you know, smacked him off of his horse. He said, why are you persecuting me? Now, Jesus was already ascended to the right hand of God at that moment. Paul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus felt it because his body was suffering in the same way. Because we know Christ suffered, we know we will suffer. He is the head. We are the body. The head is not going to encounter something that the body itself will not encounter as well. I want to be clear on that so we're not surprised when these things happen. So we're not caught off guard. We belong to him. And that's one of the joys we can have in our suffering is knowing. I mean, that just further confirms that we're truly joined with Christ when we suffer for him. And second, of course, Paul knew uh, that it would bear eternal fruit for the church. We know what, what Christ did. The, the word of God tells us for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he would endure the cross. I want us to be thinking about this. Are we willing to suffer in this life for somebody else's sake? Are we willing to suffer in this life for somebody else's sake. I'm going to go over this a thousand times, hopefully right now. Suffering is never without a purpose when you are in Christ. And I'll clarify what I mean. Let's go to this next part of the scripture because whew, this is where it gets a little, a little interesting. Paul says this, and I fill up, still in verse 24, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. You may have to read that one a couple times in there because, uh, wow, I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's affliction. If this doesn't totally confuse you, you may find it to be very heretical. Where you go, is this heresy? What is Paul saying here? At first glance, uh, it, can be, it can stump us. Um, and we can have a tendency that when there are difficult passages, we just kind of skip over them. And I'm telling you something, you're missing out if you do. We want to tackle them. We want to dive into them. We want to address this. Because our other option, if we're not skipping over it entirely, the problem is we can also come up with false theology. We can kind of make up things on our own. In fact, I I've been told that this concept within the uh, Catholic church system of purgatory comes from this passage that somehow there's more suffering that we have to go through uh, later on, especially if you haven't really grabbed on to the faith like you should, that there's kind of this thought uh, for further suffering in this way. So this is not what Paul is talking about here. Uh, and I believe he's drawing our attention to a couple things here. But number one, I want us to be very clear from the beginning. Number one, uh, we all must know that Christ's work for uh, the propitiation of our sins was fully complete on the cross. Amen? Christ's work of propitiation for our sins completely uh, finished, made complete on the cross. Paul himself makes that very clear in numerous places. Jesus himself declared it when he was on the cross. Do you remember that moment where he is hanging on the cross? His work was done and what did he say? It is is finished no more it is finished it is established the veil was torn the door to the presence of god opened it is finished and he sat down at the right hand of god his work complete so let's be clear on this nothing is lacking in the work of christ for the propitiation of our sins nothing is lacking christ's work uh, for our sins is complete However, here's what I want us to think about. Here is what is lacking. The presentation of the work of Christ that he accomplished on the cross. I'll say it again. The presentation of what Christ has done for us on the cross. That is what Paul is suffering for. Remember, Jesus is the head of the, the body. He's already told us we're going to follow in his example uh, that we will suffer for his name's sake and for the sake of the gospel, that all may come to saving faith. Paul is continuing in Christ's footsteps, just like we are called to do, that others may come to saving faith. What Christ did is not lacking. What is lacking is what he did being known to the ends of the earth. 
That is a work that Christ has given us. Of course, Jesus could have done that, but he's given it to us. That was the Great Commission. Go into all the world and, and preach the gospel to all nations. Baptize them. Teach them. Make disciples of every nation. And so Paul is saying, look, I'm, I'm filling up even in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to, don't forget this phrase because it's in the literal translation, in regards to the afflictions of Christ. And what is lacking here is the world knowing what Christ has done. Martin Luther said it this way. Uh, he famously said this. It wouldn't matter if Jesus died a thousand times if no one ever heard about it. If no one ever heard about it. You know, uh, it's a little too late to tell somebody the good news when they're gone, right? It's not going to do them an ounce of good. We have a, a kind of a famous family member within our extended family. And uh, this person has the uh, habitual... Um, you know, uh, efforts, the habitual uh, way of doing things that at the end of a time of a large group gathering, we've eaten, you know, a big dinner and we're cleaning up the kitchen, we're doing dishes. Without fail, this person will saunter in about one minute after we are all done, after it took us hours to clean, and they'll come in and say, okay, what can I do? I'm ready to help. And we all say the same thing. Yeah, that would have been great about two hours ago. We're all finished. Thank you. It does no good coming after the fact. This is the deal. Christ could die and he could die again. And of course he won't because it's all finished. But it doesn't mean anything unless the world has an opportunity to hear it and believe it. Remember what Paul says. How is anybody going to know God unless somebody tells them? And how is somebody going to tell them unless they're sent? And, and how are they sent unless somebody goes? We, we know this passage. Nobody is going to know about Christ unless they have the opportunity to hear it. And they can't hear it unless somebody shares it. And somebody can't share it unless they're sent uh, by Christ going uh, to the ends of the earth. This is what we're talking about here. It's the job God has given us. This is the way we share in the sufferings of Christ. I'm going to give you a line. I want you to either write it down, to think about it, uh, wrestle with it. But this is what I believe Paul is saying here. The cross of Jesus, the cross Jesus bore, the cross of Christ was for the, uh, is for pr uh, propitiation. And the cross that we bear is for the presentation of that propitiation. So I want to say that again because I don't want to stumble through it for you. The cross of Christ was for propitiation. If you don't know, that means the atoning of our sins. So the cross of Christ was for propitiation. The cross we're called to bear is for presentation of that propitiation. And so Paul is saying it in this way. Like I said earlier, God has ordained that salvation is spread through suffering. Jesus suffered for salvation. We suffer to spread salvation. Christ suffered for salvation. That work is complete. We suffer for the spreading of salvation. The only lack Paul is referring to here is the lack of a world yet knowing of Christ's saving work on the cross. It's for that purpose that he and that we continue to suffer, to fill up even in our fleshly bodies the lack of the presentation of the good news of what Christ went through on the cross. That is why we are called to suffer. Here's something I just found interesting. I wanted to add this in there. It wasn't a part of my notes, but I want to share this with you because I just it helped me so much this past week in looking at this verse. When it says that he fills up in his flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions, let's focus on that word affliction. Because here's a neat thing. This word in the Greek is only ever used one time in the New Testament, and it's right here. It's only ever used right in this moment. And you know what this word affliction is referring to? A pressing down on one's spirit. It means a burden on one's spirit. So look at this. What is the one thing that would be burdening the spirit of Christ? What is the one thing that just presses on him that he desires most? It is that the world may come to repentance and salvation through the work he did on the cross. Paul says, look, I am filling up even in my flesh what is lacking the presentation of the gospel in regards to what's burdening Christ in regards to what is pressing down on his spirit. That's that word affliction. So Paul says, I am filling up uh, in myself right now, going through these sufferings. I'm filling up in my physical body what is lacking in regards to the burden that's on Christ's heart for the world, that they may come to know him. 
that they may come to him. I just, I love that. Sit on that for a little bit. Think on that. The question is, are we understanding our call to suffering for the sake of others? Are we willing to participate in that suffering and to possibly do it joyfully? Do it joyfully. I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about this if nobody's ever asked you this before. But where would you be without the suffering of Christ? Right now, if Christ had not chosen to suffer and die for us, where would you be right now? Because here's the thing. It is the same place that many will be without your willingness to suffer for the spread of the gospel. Where would you be without the suffering of Christ? Because it's the same place so many will be without your willingness to suffer for the gospel of Christ. We have to think about this. This is what we signed up for in Jesus, is to follow after him, to be like him. We have to understand something, and I want to be clear as we end this particular section right here. We are not talking about suffering for suffering's sake. God is not a masochist. It's not that he wants us to hurt ourselves or beat ourselves or we're supposed to suffer for no reason. We're also not talking about a suffering that comes from our own bad choices. We can suffer all because of the mistakes we've made, and that has nothing to do with anything. The suffering that God calls us to, that we will find ourselves in for the sake of the gospel in the name of Jesus, even those moments we're suffering and we're not quite sure why and what's going on, if we are a pipeline for Christ, every moment of suffering is for an eternal purpose, for the salvation of somebody, for the edification of somebody, for the encouragement of somebody. Every single time we suffer is purposeful for the kingdom of God and for eternity. God does not call us to suffer for suffering's sake. It is always purposeful. And I want to say it again. The cross that Christ bore was for propitiation. The cross that we are called to bear is for presentation of that propitiation. And I really pray that that begins to sink into us because that is uh, the matter of eternity for somebody. It's a matter of encouragement for somebody out there. So now I want us to turn to verse 25 and take a look at the purpose of Paul's suffering. I had for myself uh, titled this message so I could remember Paul's peril and purpose as presenter. And so you're going to see all three of these. Uh, we just went through the peril of what Paul's, Paul's called to do in his suffering. And now I want us to look at the purpose of Paul's suffering and what he's called to. The NIV says it this way, and I love this translation because it's most accurate in this verse, but I'll tell you what some of yours may say. Verse 25, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. I have become its servant. Its is referring to the church. The church's servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Very important right here. Because this word is not just reserved for Paul. It's not just reserved for those in professional ministry. I want us to remember or maybe to know what this word is. Some of your translations will say, I have become a minister of the word of God, a minister of the gospel. That word uh, right here that I want us to understand is uh, a Greek word you may be familiar with uh, through teaching at your church. Uh, diakonos. Diakonos, which is where we get the word deacon uh, in churches. And it literally means servant. So where you see minister, it, it literally means servant and not just any servant. An errand boy, uh, it means it's lower actually than a waiter. Sometimes people refer to it as a waiter, but it more means almost a bus boy. That you're, you know, you're coming up and you're cleaning up behind people. You're setting the table so they can enjoy what they have. You're an errand boy. You're a bus boy. You are a servant of servants. It's the same word Jesus is going to tell his disciples. If you want to be the greatest in my kingdom, then be minister of all. That means literally be servant of all. But it's that word minister, diakonos, that he's going to use right there. You want to be great in my kingdom, then you need to be servant of all, minister of all. Each one of us is called to this purpose. Paul speaks of being commissioned for this work, and hopefully we all know how true that is. If you know Paul's amazing transformation story, uh, and if you're not as familiar with it, we don't have time today, but I want to encourage you, go to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 26. Um, I want you to take a look and familiarize yourself with the commission that God gave to Paul. Uh, because it's it's breathtaking. He transformed him from a persecutor of uh, Christians 
to a presenter uh, to and of Christians. And I'll tell you about that in just a second. God literally called him that verse we read earlier uh, today where, where God tells Ananias, go, because Paul is my chosen instrument. He's going to be my chosen instrument to the Gentiles, to the Israelites, and I'll show him how much he must suffer for my name. Paul says, I have become the church's servant by the commission God gave me. Now listen to this part, to present to you the word of God in its fullness, to present to you the word of God in its fullness. And he's going to continue on. I want to just right now, because it's fun and you're going to have to say it a few times to get maybe the meaning. There's two uh, ways Paul was commissioned. Two things Paul was commissioned to. Listen to this, okay? Uh, he was commissioned as presenter to them of the truth. And he was also commissioned to be presenter of them to the truth. So somebody's got to write that down. You can see the fun play on words here that, that I'm doing. But he is presenter to the people of the truth, Jesus Christ and his word. He's also a presenter of the people to the truth, Jesus Christ. And we're going to see both of those play out within this passage. This is not just a, a Paul commission. This is a commission each one of us has as a sharer of the word of God, as a reconciler of people between them and Christ, that we would be ones who present to people the truth and one day can present people to the truth. And we'll go into that. So this is what it looks like. He's a commissioned a commissioner of a, as a presenter to them of the truth. And here's what he says he's presenting. The word of God in its fullness. The word of God in its fullness. Did you catch that? He says, I, I'm to present to you the word of God in its fullness. That means not just what's nice and easy, not just what's cute and fluffy and makes you feel good on the inside. I am to proclaim to you, present to you the fullness of God's word, even those things that are difficult, even those things that are challenging, that will make you want to plug your ears. His commission by God was to present the gospel, the truth of God's word to them in its fullness, in its fullness. Look at verse 26. He's going to further describe this. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. And we're pausing right here for just a second. We're going to pause uh, for the moment. I want to describe to you this word mystery because he's used it a couple times. He's using it a couple times right here. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations. I got to be honest with you. Every time I see the word mystery in the Bible, I go, ooh, because I love Nancy Drew. I've been a Nancy Drew girl my whole life. I love Matlock and Murder, She Wrote. And when I see mystery, I'm like, oh, what are we getting into? I just love it. I mean, ask my sisters. It's a blast. I love it so much. That's not the word mystery, though, that Paul is talking about. But if it can grab your attention, good. Let it be used for that and then understand what he means. First, it's really uh, important for us to understand that once again, Paul is using this play on words with the word mystery to really go at these false teachers, these early Gnostic teachers, Hellenistic philosophers who are trying to creep their way into uh, the, the um, church of Jesus. And Paul's coming at them again. Why? Because that was their propaganda. That's what they would try to sell. Hey, look, there's this mysterious knowledge you don't yet know about. So if you'll come with us, if you'll be initiated into our group, we can help you understand the secret and hidden things uh, in this world, the hidden knowledge that you don't have yet because only a few special people possess it. We have this mysterious knowledge, but we'll give it to you, you know, for a price. We'll give it to you if you come and do the things we say. Paul says, listen, I want to talk to you about a mystery. There's only ever been one. And here's what it means in the Greek. This word mystery, what he's talking about right here is referring to something uh, that was once unknown and has now been made known to everybody, to the whole world. In other words, it's no longer a secret. There is no more secrets. God has revealed it to the ends of the earth. God has revealed it to all who would know it. Paul says this mystery, and there's only one, has been hidden, has been kept hidden for ages and generations all throughout the Old Testament. The prophets prophesying about this and not really understanding what it was they were saying. God has been talking about this moment in Ezekiel and Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah. He's been talking about it for so long. And Paul says, now it has been disclosed to the Lord's people. Now it has been made known to the whole world. 
He says that even among the Gentiles, the glorious riches of this mystery has been made known. When you think about it, I was kind of thinking about it like this. You can tell me, you know, what you all think. But, you know, my kids, uh, my husband and I are very affectionate and we're very lovey. I'm very touchy-feely. And we have a very close family, a lot of open communication. Um, we're very tight-knit. But, you know, my husband and I, we'll see each other. We'll definitely want to kiss each other or, or go hug each other or something. But anyway, both my kids, even though they're older now, ever since they were little, maybe yours is like, they'll literally just like, oh, gross, mom, dad, bro, no, we don't want to see that. You know, and they cover their eyes. And I can remember when my son was really little, that was his uh, reaction, over the top reaction to us, even hugging. Why would you ever, and this was his thing, why would you ever want to touch a girl's mouth with your mouth. That is disgusting, Dad. And you'd have to tell him something like this. Son, I know you don't understand it right now. But one day, you not only will understand it, but you're going to want to take part in it. Right? This is that mystery. What was once hidden from them is now made known. I have a 16-year-old son who, let me just tell you, even though he has yet to uh, kiss a girl, uh, because that's the convictions that God has given him, he wants to. And make no mistake about that. He cannot wait until he is married. He cannot wait uh, until he's in that type of a relationship with a woman God has brought to him um, for marriage. I'm going to tell you something. The older he gets, this mystery is being revealed to him. He finally gets it. His eyes are open to it. It's no longer hidden or kept hidden from him. And this is how it was. At one point, God's people didn't get this. They didn't understand it. Why, God, are you saying that you are going to actually put yourself in us? that your spirit is going to come to be in us, that you're going to give us a new covenant and a new heart. What are you talking about? Until now. And Paul says, now we get it. Now we understand. And this is what it is. Let's finish verse 27 because this is what I've been waiting for since we started this. I love it. Let's go to verse 27. He says, uh, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you the hope of glory christ in you can we just can we just put that on repeat christ in you the hope of glory christ in you the hope of glory we talk a lot i've talked a lot about what it means that we are in christ today i'm thrilled to talk about what it means that christ is in us because it's both if you didn't know this Get ready to have your mind like Bible blown today because it's so amazing. We are not only in Christ, but Christ Jesus himself is in us. And somebody needs to be reminded of this one today. Somebody does. So here's what I want you to understand. This is the way I have always said it. Uh, some, a way I've explained it to my family and friends. But this is what I love to say about it. We will experience all the promises of God because we are in Christ. So because we are in Christ, go to Ephesians chapter 1. If you don't believe me, it will say it continuously. In Christ, you are chosen. In Christ, you are adopted. In Christ, you are redeemed and forgiven and justified and sanctified. In Christ, all the promises of God towards us are yes and amen in Christ. Because we are in Christ, we will experience all the promises that God has ever made to us. But because Christ is in us, we will also experience all the power of God in us. This is huge. So we experience the promises of God because we are in Christ. We experience the power of God because Christ is in us. Did anybody hear what we're talking about? Christ Jesus, creator, Savior, supreme ruler, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is in us. And all of the supremacy that indwells him, the power, the magnet, uh, magnet, the, the, oh my goodness, I'm getting excited here. The power and the magnitude of what Christ is and who he is, is now in us. Listen to what Ephesians 1, uh, 19 through 22 says. And how great, how very great is Christ's power that is at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly world, at his right hand. 
Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. He has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. God has put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as supreme Lord over all things. It is this Christ who lives in me, who lives in you. And Paul says, are you understanding this? The power of God is in you because Christ is in you. We experience the promises of God because we're in Christ. We experience all the power of Christ because he is in us. I hope somebody is saying amen somewhere. I want to tell you something. Some of the greatest accomplishments, and I want to get real here for a little bit. I hope I've been real this whole time. But some of the greatest accomplishments of believers, I believe, have come through the early Christians have come through the very first thing back to Peter and James and John and Mark and Mary and, and Martha. And, and you keep going through Lydia, uh, um, uh, Priscilla um, and Ananias. And you keep going through all of these early Christians. Some of the most remarkable things for God took place through those people. And I just want to point out to you, they didn't even have the New Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. These letters were just beginning to be written. The Gospels would come even later. They did not have the New Testament, and yet, how were they doing all of these things? They didn't have the New Testament. What they understood sometimes better than us is they had the New Covenant. They had the New Covenant. What God had promised would come was now theirs. When he said, one day, I'm going to give you a new covenant. I'm going to pour my spirit into you. I'm going to remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'm going to be in you and you are going to be in me. This is the new covenant. This is the new covenant. They didn't have the New Testament. They had the new covenant. And I feel like one of the greatest tragedies of our day in the church is that often we forget the new covenant living because we have the New Testament. Somebody might get upset with this, but I want you to hear what I'm saying. So please wait and let me explain what I'm saying. Sometimes we forget that we are called to live a new covenant life because we do have access to the New Testament. For some of us, our Trinity can become God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scriptures. Did you hear the difference? Because sometimes we don't catch it. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Scriptures. Now, I do not want you to mistake me for one single second. If you know anything about me, you're going to know that, that I give my life for the Word. I love the Word of God more than anything. It is of the utmost vital importance to us. It is God's Word. And through His Word, we will get to know Him. He reveals Himself to us. Through His Word, our actions are either confirmed or they are corrected as we follow Christ who lives in us. I'm going to say it again. The Bible serves to confirm or to correct the actions we are taking as we follow Christ who is in us. You see, the early church, before they had all these letters, they just knew what the new covenant meant. Jesus Christ himself was in them, and he was directing them. He would be the one to say, turn here and go right, and Peter, go talk to this person. John, I want you to touch this person. And he was directing them because he lived in them. And then later, as the church it was formed, and the Gospels were written, and the letters were sent out, these churches were able to take them and say, okay, have we been doing it correctly, or do we need a correction? And they could also read through this and go, man, what we're doing is right on. It's exactly what God has said, and they were confirmed in their actions. The Bible will confirm or correct our actions as we follow Christ who is in us. Do not mistake me. The Bible is of utmost importance, but we cannot afford to forget the new covenant that we are living in, that we are following Christ because he is in us. This is the new covenant. The veil was torn. And I pray, I pray that we would be spirit-led, Christ-led Christians confirmed or corrected by the word. That's my prayer, that we would be spirit-led, Christ-led followers who are either confirmed or corrected by the word of God. I love 2 Corinthians 13, 5. It says, do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? Jesus Christ is in you. I want you to think about something. This was on my mind because 
you know, my son Jaden, you, you know, he loves basketball and, and he's played basketball for years. He loves it. He wants to keep going further with it. And he spends all this time looking, you know, at uh, film, studying film of like, you know, your best players, because I'm not as well versed. I'm just going to say like, you know, Michael Jordan or Shaquille O'Neal or whoever it may be. He's watching all of this film, studying it. And then he gets frustrated if when he goes out onto the courts, he still can't operate exactly like they did it. He can't, he, he can't make his stance the right way. His, his shooting arm is not quite right. Uh, the baskets don't fall the same way, you know, that, that Michael Jordan's falls. Because what he does not need at that moment is to be an imitator of Michael Jordan. He needs Michael Jordan to uh, impart himself into him. Here's what I mean by that. Things would change for my son if Michael Jordan could somehow be in him. I want you to think about it. I mean, all of a sudden on the basketball court, if Michael Jordan was in him, I mean, he'd be hitting every shot, shots he could never make before. His defense would be perfect. His offense would be off the chain for his age. I mean, his feet, his footing would be amazing. His ball handling would be stellar. Why? Because the legend Michael Jordan was in him doing the work through him. Folks, this is what it is. We aren't dealing just with an imitation where we only imitate Christ we are dealing with the impartation of Christ, Christ in us. This is the reason now why Christ can speak to us and we can now act like him, walk like him, do things like him and in his power. In fact, Jesus said, greater things than what I have done, you will do because I will be in you. Because he is in us, he will position us uh, correctly, direct us correctly, lead us speak to us, cause us to turn right or left. And like I said, if time is allowed, I would tell you what he's been doing in our family, but he's been utilizing this all over the place this past week. Do you guys remember in Acts chapter three, uh, the story is given to us of Peter and John. They're on their way for their typical temple um, prayers, like every Jewish man or woman would do. And they're on their way. They pass this lame man who is begging by this gate. Now it says that he's been there daily for who knows how many years. We have to remember how ordinary people are. Paul or John and Peter had been passing this guy for years, never giving him any thought. But you see, something was different this day. This was right after Pentecost, right after the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ indwelt them. Now they're passing this man, and all of a sudden, Jesus speaks to Peter. His eyes lock onto this man. Jesus bids him to go over to him and to talk to him. And we remember, you know, the song, if you grew up, uh, you know, in a Christian home with these uh, songs, but it says when Peter goes over to him, he tells him this silver and gold have I none, but what I do have, I give thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. That's part of the song for you. Uh, this is what happened with him, right? Why the change? Because at that moment, Jesus was in Peter, and that's what Jesus would have done. Jesus was in Peter operating, and he says, today, I want your eyes fixated on him, and I'm going to do something in him. He speaks to Peter. He whispers to Peter. Peter hears him, has his eyes fastened, and the miracle of God follows. That's how our lives can operate on a day-to-day -day basis when we don't forget that we live in New Covenant times that we live with Jesus himself in us. Like I said, the power of God is at work in us because Christ himself is in us. I've shared stories like this. I mean, you can be going down an aisle in the grocery store and I've been in that place where all of a sudden the Lord will speak to me. Actually, I want you to go down the cereal aisle. I go down the cereal aisle and there is a person. Go speak to that person. And I do and come to find out this is a moment that Christ wants to share uh, his, the gospel with them. It's so many different times, different scenarios all over the place. But at this moment, I mean, can you just think of how amazing this was for the early church, especially the Gentiles? The promises of God and the power of God had always been exclusively for Israel, but now God's full plan for all of humanity has been revealed. And Paul is saying, hey, you Colossians, you people in Spokane, you people in Dallas and in Phoenix and in LA, the mystery that's been hidden has now been revealed. The glorious riches of this mystery is this. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in you. I mean, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me. He will whisper what he wants us to do. He works through us and we will watch miracles 
unfolds. Now, how does Paul, to wrap this up, go about presenting this? Remember, he said he was, he was commissioned to present to them the truth, right? And so he tells us this. He, Jesus, is the one that we proclaim, admonishing, and teaching everybody with all wisdom. He gives three ways that somebody who is called to be a presenter of God's word is supposed to do. He says, number one, we proclaim. We're going to proclaim the word of Christ, proclaim the good news of the gospel. And then he says, we're going to admonish. That word means warn. Paul was going to give warnings. Do not go down this road. This is what will happen. Do not listen to these people. They're wrong. They're not of Christ. He's going to admonish. He's going to warn. And he's going to teach. You see, God wasn't just interested only in converts. He was interested in disciples. And so the full scope of somebody called into ministry, which I got to tell you, is pretty much all of us. Your audience may be your children right now, your coworkers, your siblings, your parents, your friends at school. It may be formal in a formal way uh, in a Bible college, but the ministry that Christ has given us is one of proclamation, one of warning, and one of teaching. And he gives them the reason for it. And it's right here. It's the second part of his commission. So that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. So that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Remember, I told you he was commissioned as a presenter to them of the truth. And now we see that he's a presenter of them to the truth. So now it's his job to present the church that he's been entrusted with the followers of Christ he's been entrusted with, he will one day present them to Jesus, to the truth. So he's going to present them to the truth. And this is what this means. I'm going to present everyone, he says, fully mature in Christ. Notice he actually said we, so that we, we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. That word in some of your translations may say perfect. It may say complete. The meaning here really truly is mature. Paul was not interested in surface level Christians. One who wants to give mouth service but have no life to back it up. One who becomes a stump. They don't grow past this one point. He says, my job is to not only present you with the word of God in its fullness, but it's also to present you to the word in your fullness. That means I'm going to present you before Christ as one who is mature, as one who has grown up. You're not staying at the same level. We can look at you. God can look at you and say, they've grown, Paul, under your care. They have become mature. They're equipped. They're complete in this way. Paul was, like I said, not about making converts, but making disciples, mature believers. This is a call for every leader in ministry. Listen to how he closes in verse 29. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. How does Paul do all of this? How does he know what he's running after? How does he keep going? He says, and here's that, I want to give it to you in the original uh, uh, language here. I labor striving. I labor striving with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I labor. Do you know what that word labor means? Some of you women who have ever given birth is going to really uh, pay attention to this. This word labor, it means to feel fatigue to work hard, to grow weary, to be tired, to be exhausted, to labor with effort. Anybody ever given birth? Anybody want to say amen? To feel fatigue, to work hard, to grow weary, to be tired, exhausted, to labor with effort. Paul is saying, look, I am laboring for you. I am laboring. I am often exhausted, weak, burnt out. I'm laboring with effort. I'm fatigued. And he says, not only am I laboring, but I labor striving. That word striving means uh, like an athlete trains. That I am working my body so hard because I'm, stra I'm training for uh, contending for the prize. It means to fight, to contend, to engage in conflict, striving for that prize. In other words, he is taking this dead seriously. And you know what? I found great comfort in this. I needed to hear this this week because there are times where I will feel so weak in my faith because I am burnt out and I'll feel exhausted and tired and I'll cry out to God, God, I don't know if I can keep going. I don't know if I can keep doing this anymore. There's just so much need and there's so much, uh, Lord, for this world and, and you're the answer to everything and you're the one that we need and, and I can feel so fatigued and yet Paul says, listen, I am laboring. I am striving for you. And he's being really honest. I feel fatigue. I work hard. I'm growing weary and tired and exhausted. Something that I have taught young moms 
uh, and spoken to them many times that in parenting, especially parenting young children, if you are not exhausted at the end of the day, you're not doing it right. If you are not worn out by the time you crawl into bed, you are not parenting correctly. To correctly parent, to correctly discipline and teach, you should be exhausted because it's continuous. It's constant. There's always something more to teach them, always some other way to train them, always something to be excited for uh, with how God's moving in their lives, always more of Christ you can show and you can share with them. If you're not exhausted, you may not be doing it correctly. Paul's saying the same thing to us. It's going to be hard work. It's going to be tiring. Sometimes it's wrongly preached at us, and I get the intent. The intent is good, and, and he'll follow through with that in just a second. But sometimes we can start thinking, well, if I'm tired, then I must just be doing this all in my own strength. If I'm tired, clearly uh, I'm not as connected with Christ right now, and, and I'm just operating on my own. And I don't think that's true. Not necessarily. It could be. But I think even like Paul, we're going to get worn out and our physical flesh, we're going to feel tired and fatigued and sometimes burned out. But thank goodness we are not doing it on our own. And what continues us going, what, what encourages me and strengthens me and gives me the energy to go one more time, to pick up one more out of 50 books I'm studying, to, you know, to, to go to that next person or to have that next conversation. The reason why or how I do it is just like Paul. He says, I strenuously contend. Um, he, he says, with the energy of Christ powerfully at work in him. This is beyond us. And so Paul says, listen, I am laboring. I am striving. Oftentimes I'm exhausted and worn out, but I keep going. I persevere because of the energy of Christ powerfully at work in him. Christ's energy is unending. It doesn't stop. It keeps going. And he says, I am going to continue because I'm working. I'm laboring with the energy of of Christ powerfully at work in him. And again, why is that power in him? Because Christ is in him. The power of Jesus Christ lives in us. It's the same power that raised him from the dead lives in you. And he can raise us back up and keep us keep on going um, because of him living in us. We have to remember Christ is in us. His power is at work in our weakness. It's this unending energy of Christ through which we contend and strive and labor for the kingdom of God. I just want to end this way and we're going to pray together. Can I just echo what that uh, saint uh, said before her death? The best is yet to come. And we can literally live right now with a fork in our hand. As an example to everybody, we come across that when you make that choice to believe in Christ, the best is yet to come. It is going to be better than what you've had previously. May we be people who can live with a Bible in one hand and a fork in the other hand, knowing that the best is yet to come. May we be people who are willing to suffer for others for the purpose of the gospel of Christ, that we would suffer with purpose, that we would be a presenter to people of the truth, that we would be a presenter of people to the truth, that we would live out the new covenant with power, because I want to tell you, Christ is in you. Christ is in you. Listen to him. Hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. That is the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in us. May we be people who are led by Christ, confirmed or corrected by his word. Live the new covenant. Christ is in you. Well, let's pray together today. I know we just keep going over and over in our, our times. I apologize with this. There's probably even more to say but we want to go through that. I want to encourage you to keep memorizing scripture, uh, plant it within your heart. Go back and, and chew on this this week. See what God is doing through this passage in your life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for time in your word today. I thank you, God, for your power and your authority. I thank you, Lord, that when we suffer, it's not without purpose. So many in this world will aimlessly suffer will needlessly suffer. But God, when we walk through hardships, that is simply a pipe, a tubing from which you can flow to the people around us. God, I pray that we would see ourselves not as a dartboard, but as a pipeline. I pray, God, that we would understand that our suffering may mean eternity for somebody else. May we look for those opportunities. May we do it with joy. Lord, I pray, God, that we would know what it is that you've called us to chase after. Lord, that we would be a presenter to people of the truth, 
that we would be a presenter of people to the truth. And God, I pray that we would live a new covenant life, a life of you in us. Thank you, Jesus, that because we are in you, we experience all of the promises you've given us. But because you are in us, we experience all of the power that you give to us. Let us not lack that. Let us be sensitive to what you are saying and the ways you are directing us because you are alive in us. God, I love you so much. I thank you, Lord. May this bear fruit in somebody's life today. I thank you because it's been bearing fruit all week in our family's life. We love you and we give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being a part of this. Excited to see you next week.